Good morning. I'm going to start by introducing the team. You know their names from the plaques that are in front of them, obviously, but this to my right is Chief Investigator Tom Bennett, who I believe has close to 30 years of homicide and other major crime investigation experience. To my left is my first assistant, Peter McGuire, and to his left, my assistant, Bill Nagel. These are the people that I consulted with in making decisions, but I want to make it absolutely clear up front, the decisions were mine, the responsibility is mine, and I should be held accountable for all decisions in this case. Having said that, let me start by saying these have been very difficult few days for all of us, and I'm sure you can imagine that. Last night, as we, I was preparing to leave, I received a telephone call from a gentleman in Longmont. And he said, this was a voicemail, he said, you should be tarred and feathered and run out of town. And I want you to call me and tell me that you're going to resign. You know, that's, that's pretty harsh. And it's not just one. There were a lot of calls like that. Um, I called him back. And he said, well, first of all, I'm surprised that you called me. But uh, he started with a series of questions. And I'm imagining that his questions are the same questions on the top of your minds. So his first question was, why didn't you surreptitiously take DNA in Bangkok before you took this person into custody? We did. We took surreptitious DNA on multiple occasions. Immediately upon locating this person, who went to mailboxes to pick up a package that we sent to him. Two different officers took DNA off of the bicycle that he rode back. On a separate occasion, they uh, obtained a cup that he used to drink from and a tissue or wipe that he used to wipe his hands. The bottom line is that after we did that, our expert, and we put a great deal of uh, respect in our expert, from the Denver lab said that the sample in the underwear of the victim was a mixed sample and that we do not want to compare a mixed sample with a mixed sample. We need a pristine sample. That means a buckle swab. A buckle swab can only be taken by consent or by court proceeding or court order. We couldn't get his consent because he didn't know he was under investigation, and we couldn't alert him at that time. The, um, this gentleman had a number of other questions. Um, and, you know, I'm going to have to rely on the people here today to help me out to answer the specifics of the dates and times. This investigation took place over a period of approximately 90 days or more. Uh, we were successful for 99% of the time, keeping it away from media attention. Um, even though many people knew about it, it didn't leak out to the media or to the public, and we're, we're proud of our staff for accomplishing that. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that we didn't have as much control or, in fact, any control when we're dealing with a foreign government halfway around the world. They were helping us in every way possible, and we thank them from the bottom of our heart. But they have a different process for media than we do, and we couldn't prevent them from talking to the press. Um, and, of course, at some point it was inevitable that it was going to happen. Um, is there anything else that I need to cover this time? I, you know, the other thing I'd like to address right up front is I understand that there are people who are angry uh, because I've received the emails and the phone calls that they're not included in this this morning. And, it, and for some reason, they think that our office excluded them. Um, and so, and, and of course, the citizens aren't here. And those are the people that we really owe an accounting to and why we're doing this this morning. We didn't exclude anyone. We relied on the media consortium to decide who would be present this morning. We did set the number. And 
it, you know, that wasn't the main part of my reaction. Quite frankly, last week at that press conference, I was just a bit overwhelmed by people basically screaming from all different directions. I didn't feel like I could answer anybody's question in a way that they would want it answered. And we really wanted today to give you the information, to allow you to have time to come, come to us with your thoughtful questions and to give you thoughtful answers and to make sure that every one of you got your questions answered as opposed to feeling you, like you have to compete with somebody else to get your question answered. So that's why we did it. I, I expect to get calls from the citizens. I have responded to emails and calls from citizens. I will continue to do that to the extent possible so that people feel like they understand what's been going on and why we did what we did at any different place in time. You know, every one of you here knows that uh, hindsight is 2020 um, and that, you know, after the game is over, you, it's, it's easy to criticize what people have done and what decisions have been made. What I can assure you is that very um, intelligent, educated, experienced people consulted on a daily basis and questioned each other about what the options are, what are the better options, and what are the not so good options in this case, what decisions we make, and what's going to happen as a result of the decisions we make. So we didn't go into any of this without talking and thinking about it. Now, um, are there any other statements that any of you want to make prior to opening it up to questions? Let's open it up to questions then, and I think um, Carolyn's going to help us. I you had your hand up first, in the blue with glasses. Why wasn't federal charge unlawful flight to avoid prosecution used to extradite him and then get a DNA sample in California? The can we take that? Sure. Okay. There was a uh, what they call a UFAP warrant issued in this case. Uh, there was one in San Francisco. That was done through our coordination with the uh, Office of International Affairs, the Department of Justice. The, uh, the problem with that is if we would have had to bring him back on that, we would have had to go through the international extradition process, which would have required us to get a provisional arrest warrant in Thailand. We would then had 60 days. We would had to submit it independent affidavits, uh, prosecutor statements, and many, many formal proceedings in order to get over there that would have had to been translated. It actually would have greatly slowed down the process. Uh, and we were in consultation with the Department of Justice and the uh, the ICE, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Embassy in Thailand on the most expeditious process in order to be able to get him back. What was the risk in doing it, not doing it that way? <laughs> well, because in doing it that way, we would have ended up uh, with him being in custody over there at a tremendous expense and, and time consumption. I mean, it's a, it's a slow process to go through the international treaties. It's also an expensive process because all of the documents have to be translated at the Department of Justice cost, which is 80 to $85 a page. We have to pay uh, for two uh, U.S. Marshals to bring the suspect back. As oh, my God. Did it again. <laughs> I, I suspect we're going to have to leave. We'll come back at the earliest time and resume. We'll wait just a minute and then we'll come. Mary Lacey, the DA, certainly yeah, something she was not expecting. The fire alarm going off in the room there uh, in Boulder, Colorado. But fascinating details at the outset saying that uh, in Boulder, Colorado. But fascinating details at the outset saying the decisions were mine. I should be held accountable. And then detailing how they worked through investigators in Thailand to try and get samples from John Mark Carr, but insisting by law the only way to get a true sample that would fit the matches they were trying to tie uh, back together in Boulder, Colorado, that he had to come back to the U.S. And then the questioning went to, well, why not keep him in Thailand, conduct the testing while he's I uh, kept overseas. She's just suggesting in her last answer before the before the alarm went off that that would frankly have been too expensive. Uh, whatever the case, they are facing the music today and at the outset the reporters in the room were told to, uh, to be patient, go one at a time, either submit your questions in writing or raise your hand. Uh, trying to maintain some sense of decorum there in Boulder, Colorado, but uh, with that alarm going off in the background, frankly the irony is just astounding. Uh, how this case has been, um, um, if you talk to any legal analyst, let's say it was mangled from the very beginning, and that goes back to December of 1996. John Mark Carr's DNA did not match late yesterday afternoon, and that was the bombshell. 
the latest of so many that was dropped in Boulder, Colorado. What happens to him? He's expected to be back in court later today for yet another extradition hearing. He had one in L.A. a while ago uh, to go to Boulder, Colorado. This one will be going back to California, but not to L.A., but to Sonoma County, California. Uh, he's there to face a misdemeanor charge of child pornography that dates back to 2001. The, the alarm's off. Mary Lacey, back at the microphone. Bring him back. And it was very substantial. We had put together a rough budget and actually alerted the commissioners that that was a potential of what could happen. It, it became inevitable that we had to bring him back by another procedure because the Thai government uh, designated him as an undesirable person and once he's designated as an undesirable person which was uh, based on several different factors including our emails and the information we sent over there they want him out of the country they expel him within 24 to 48 hours so that made our expeditious route uh, something we absolutely had to follow um. You've released all the emails, at least all the emails that we have seen. And everyone in this room has read those emails, and clearly you are very familiar with those emails. Everything in those emails is publicly available and has been on the internet for years. So you or I or anybody in this room could have concocted a story and fantasized exactly like he did. When you brought him to Boulder, Colorado, and this was several days, five days you had, you knew who he was, then he was arrested in Thailand, then you had time, he was brought to California, and then here. In that period of time, when you brought him, when he stepped off the plane in Boulder, Colorado, what other evidence did you have? Phone records, credit card records, witnesses, anything that could place him in Boulder, in the state of Colorado, any time around Christmas of 1996. What did you have that said, other than his bizarre statements in these emails, which any of us could have concocted, what else did you have that placed him here? Well, let's start with the fact that as far as we can tell, there is no physical evidence in this case that it has not been in the public domain. The ability of our office or any law enforcement to connect this crime to a person based on something they know about it that no one else knows was gone a long time ago. That's impossible. So yours is a good question and that, you know, we, we check every time something comes up. It has this been in the public domain? I mean, for instance, there were a couple of references which, um, we weren't sure we were in the public domain. One was the fact that John Bonet had received the bracelet on her arm uh, from her mother as a Christmas present, but that's in the public domain. It's in the autopsy report. Um, the other one was the uh, presence of the mucus from the nose under the tape, not over it, but under it. Um, you could, I mean, a child's going to have a runny nose. That it's not going to take the a leap of faith to come have? up with that. What else did you have? Well, I'm laying that the groundwork for that because that was impossible. What we had to rely on was an attempt to try to verify this person's credibility. And so what we were looking at was approximately four or five hundred pages of emails. Are the other things that he's told us since there's nothing in the crime? Are the other things he's told us, can we verify those? And if you've read these, you all know that there's some pretty bizarre facts that he's alleged in the emails. We have been, we were able to verify that in fact, these things had occurred, that he wasn't fantasizing about what he was saying in his emails. That when he talked about his mother burning him when he was a child, his mother did burn him when he was a child. Now, when we read that, we didn't think that that was accurate. There, his occupation. I'm trying his, to understand, getting to the point, how is that related to the Ramsey case? Because he was a pedophile in Thailand, because his mother burned him, what did that have to do with him concocting a story which you or I could have concocted? And what specific other evidence you had time to check his credit records, his, his phone records, everything, you had that time before he stepped off a plane here in Boulder? We started immediately upon his detention checking background and checking credit card records. Um, we checked financial records. Frankly, and 
The first thing that we wanted to do was to determine whether he was in Boulder on December 25th, 1996, from May when we learned of this. And there are a lot of different ways, background checks and databases that you can use to establish that. We were not able to establish he was in Boulder, but as importantly, we were not able to establish that he was not in Boulder. It didn't help us either way, and that remains the information, the best information we have at this time. There's circumstantial photographic evidence of his three sons in Atlanta with the in-laws at Christmas time. He's not in the photos. The wife and he were to a great degree estranged at the time. So the former wife, who we find to be very credible and very helpful and very cooperative, she did everything she could to dig up every document photo she could find and she interviewed with officers for some 10 to 12 hours was unable to establish and when actually asked can you state he was with you she had to say no I can't that's not my best recollection is what she said but I can't state that so in answer to your question we started immediately as well as calling in the Boulder Police Department who started immediately to help us establish that is there anything that you want to add to that, Tom? Because certainly you were. You want to add to that, Tom? Because certainly you were part of that time period and what was being done investigative-wise. Yeah, we reached out to uh, quite a few agencies around the country where this gentleman had resided at previously. We solicited uh, assistance from a good number of agencies. A thorough background was done, and the closest time frame we've come up with thus far is we know his whereabouts up to December 23rd, 1996. So bottom line, you had no evidence when he stepped off the plane in Boulder. You had absolutely no evidence other than his bizarre emails, which, as, which you agree that, you, that a person could have concocted. That's the only thing you had that would place him in this crime scene. In other words, you had nothing, essentially, other than his statements. We had probable cause to arrest him based on our having tested other statements within the emails and the telephone calls, which is typically how we test credibility on someone. Are they prone to lying about other things in their lives? Because if they're lying about other things, they're probably lying about this, too. We also had taken advantage of a forensic uh, psychologist who deals with cases of this nature and had met with him and talked to him extensively and he was helping us to look at the nature of the emails and the nature of the telephone calls. It was his opinion that this person was dangerous, that this person was escalating, that the psychopathy for committing this type of crime was in fact present in this person. Is that proof he did it? Uh, no. but. You do have an explanation. But, but that's bottom consistent. line is what you're saying is is that you had his statements, but Tom Bennett's saying we reached out. We have you had nothing else. There's nothing that placed him in Boulder. Nothing that placed him in Colorado except his bizarre statements that he was here and he committed the crime. That's all you had. Nothing else. No, we were saying that there was external corroboration of other details within his... Uh, no, no, external corroboration of his background. And I, so I know what you're saying, but what I'm saying is we had external corroboration. Everything was in the media. We couldn't... We, we combed over everything that we had to see if there was anything in there that we could possibly look at that couldn't possibly have been gleaned. But I think that you've got to take into account that this guy confessed numerous occasions uh, in great detail. He confessed in emails. He confessed in telephone conversations, showing a great deal of emotion, indicating he was sorry, and he regretted what he had done, and didn't want to put the, uh, the Ramsey family through any more harm, uh, taped conversations. He also, when contacted by investigator Mark Spray, a statement against his penal interest directly to a police officer, he admitted to every one of those factors and admitted that he was, in fact, the killer. Now, it can be characterized as we didn't have anything except bizarre emails, but this, you got to remember, this was a bizarre crime. And the person who committed this crime acted in a bizarre way. And so there's internal corroboration there as well. <clears throat> so in answer to your question, I think that we did have, we did have information to go on. With other people's turn. Go ahead, I think in the orange you have your hand up pretty high. I'm Jean Casares from Court TV News. From what I understand you're saying, you still don't truly know where he was December 25th and 26th of 1996. 
So did you not file formal charges solely on not having a match on the DNA? Um, here's what exact, you're, you're correct in your statement. Um, Mr. Carr said to us at one point, you will not be able, my wife will not, ex-wife will not be able to tell you or provide an alibi of where I was from December 23rd through January 4th. In fact, when she was questioned, she could not alibi him between December 23rd and January 2nd. So there was a couple of days discrepancy. Um, that's an odd consistency between their two statements. So uh, can we establish for sure that he was in Atlanta? No. But all of the family members, and most of them were interviewed by police officers, have stated that, to the best of their recollection, she says, I wouldn't have been at my in-laws on Christmas with the, you know, I wouldn't go to his parents without him. It makes no sense. And there was a new baby in the family. The new baby's in the picture. The people remember the new baby. So when you say, was it the DNA, the linchpin, it was based on his story. The DNA could be an artifact. It isn't necessarily the killers in all, and there's a probability that it's the killers, but it could be something else. But the way he told the story, it had to be his, and it's not. So once that came back, it's not a match. He is not the killer. You talk about hindsight 2020, and I'm not sure if it's better or worse than 2020 at this point for you. In what sense, are you embarrassed? What went wrong? You know, I, I'm not embarrassed. I feel bad for a community that questions what we did because, you know, they've lost some trust in the system. Um, I think that if they had been in my seat, in the seats of the four of us up here, making the decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, I think that that's the only way you can understand that you do your best with what you have at the moment and it changes from hour to hour um, so I, I feel bad for for my community that voted me into office that they may have lost some faith in me um, I hope that's not the case I I think we did a good job for the community and certainly protecting the community was one of our our primary goals here yeah. um, Peter Alexander NBC News there have been a series of harsh statements directed toward you, including one from Gary Harris, who represents the Carr family, even this morning saying you should be disbarred, he said. What comments would you share with John Carr, were you to direct them to him, and with the Carr family? You know, uh, John Carr inserted himself into this. Um, so I don't have a great deal of sympathy for John Carr. I have sympathy for his family especially for the ex-wife who has three children. I wish more than anything they would not have been subjected to the media attention, but his brother and his father, who's elderly as well. John Carr himself sincerely believes that he killed JonBenet Ramsey. There's no question in anybody's mind about that. So I have very little sympathy for him. In the red. Carol McKinley with Fox News Channel. I can't hear you very uh, well. I'm Carol McKinley with Fox News Channel. Um, do you think there's been any damage done for any possible future arrests now that this guy has fizzled out? What will happen if someone else is arrested later and then they can say, well, this guy was wrong, I'm wrong, they were wrong about me too? You know, believe it or not, Mr. Carr is not the first suspect that we have investigated over the past four years. There have been several. We have made trips to other places to investigate other suspects. It didn't come to media attention because it was in this country and we were able to control it and to eliminate people without having to, to go through this process. We fully intend, and in fact we had uh, engaged a contract investigator to help us because of the impending death of Patsy Ramsey and because of the 10 year anniversary. Those events bring up leads and legitimate as well as non-legitimate, um, illegitimate leads. And we fully intend to follow up every legitimate lead, including anyone who makes statements that they committed the crime. And obviously we do not want it to be in the media every time. We will try very hard to avoid In the red. Carol McKinley with Fox News Channel. I can't hear you very uh, well. I'm Carol McKinley with Fox News Channel. Um, 
Do you think there's been any damage done for any possible future arrests now that this guy has fizzled out? What will happen if someone else is arrested later and then they can say, well, this guy was wrong, I'm wrong, they're wrong about me too? You know, believe it or not, Mr. Carr is not the first suspect that we have investigated over the past four years. There have been several. We have made trips to other places to investigate other suspects. It didn't come to media attention because it was in this country and we were able to control it and to eliminate people without having to, to go through this process. We fully intend, and in fact, we had uh, engaged a contract investigator to help us because of the impending death of Patsy Ramsey and because of the 10 year anniversary. Those events bring up leads and legitimate as well as non-legitimate, um, illegitimate leads. And we fully intend to follow up every legitimate lead, including anyone who makes statements that they committed the crime. And obviously we do not want it to be in the media every time. We will try very hard to avoid that. So what was different about this guy that, as opposed to someone like, a, like some of the other guys who we know you seriously looked at in the past nine and a half years. What was so different about this guy and why, did he, why was the arrest made on him and not the others? Well, the difficulty with this person is that uh, most of the time when you look at what a person tells you they committed the crime and here's how they did it, you can discount it almost immediately. Um, it's not just that it's bizarre, but there are factors in it where you can say this person is just dead wrong. And that most of the time that happens, I'd say 95% of the time. Occasionally someone contacts us who appears to be uh, a little more serious. In this case, because he believed it himself and continues to believe, he had all of the emotional um, import that you would have when, did anyone have an opportunity to listen to the telephone calls of the 15th of July and the 22nd of July? The man is sobbing as he's telling his story. He, he can't talk, he goes away from the phone, he comes back. Uh, he has the psychopathy, the background that you would expect or look for in a person who's committed a crime of this nature. This was an extremely violent crime. Uh, so when you combine the psychopathy and his statements and his emotional import um, and his knowledge of the crime, and his knowledge of the family. We spent time with John and Patsy Ramsey. And something that John Ramsey said to me was that, and he read the emails, had read them previously. He said, this person has personal knowledge of these family members. His description of the Paw women is right on. He said, I don't know how they would know that. You wouldn't see it from the outside. He said, his description of John Bonet and Burke and how they related to each other, he said it's it's dead on. He knows me. So John's take on it was you need to pay attention to this and this was back in May of this year. In the back row. Speaking of the ongoing nature of, of your investigation, then would it be fair to say that is any involvement by either John or Patsy Ramsey completely ruled out by your office? Are you committed to an intruder theory of the crime? What we are committed to is solving the crime if we possibly can. You know, there's this these terms out there, umbrella of suspicion. We don't use that. You know, no one is really cleared of a homicide until there's a conviction in court beyond a reasonable doubt. And I don't think you will get any prosecutor, unless they were present with the person at the time of the crime, uh, to clear someone where like in this case, the facts are so uh, strange. And you know, obviously the family was in the house at the time. The DNA does not match. You know, so what we can say is, I think an expert said, it's, it's, you have to look at stranger male DNA in the underwear of a dead victim. Kelly Kobiella, CBS News. Um, if what you're saying then is true, that the DNA could come from an external source and not the killer, and all of the evidence is out in the public domain, can you or anyone ever get a conviction in this case? A conviction? Well, we have said for quite some time that a conviction would come from a confession that we could verify through investigation or from a cold hit on the DNA. Because if we get a hit on the DNA, which is in CODIS, and of course, 
that's the beginning of the investigation, not the end, then certainly that person had better have a pretty good explanation of how their DNA ended up in that underwear. Can I add a little? Sure. Bit? You know, on page 64 of the affidavit, I think they explain why it is that we believe that the DNA, or we believe that the DNA in this case was such strong evidence. So I think if you go back to page 64 of the affidavit, about halfway down, you'll get a description of facts and circumstances that would would mandate that the DNA mixed with the blood. Solving a crime and convicting people and holding them accountable for the crime. And you know, I'm losing a little bit of my voice, so I might have these these guys up here help me with a couple of these questions. In the blue shirt. Yeah, Neil Karlinski with ABC News. Was your office unanimous in the dealing of Mr. Carr? Were th was there any dissent or any red flags raised by anyone in the office, as so many armchair prosecutors did from almost minute one, frankly, on this case? If you want to take somebody else, want to take that? That's you know, softball. We, we talked about this for, throughout the beginning. We had, we kept it as a fairly closely held secret within our own office because we didn't want information to get out there. Uh, and we went back and forth on it uh, in terms of what should we do. I mean, because in some real sense, we understood that if this got out, these kinds of things could happen. Uh, and you know, we were uh, we were of one mind at the end that this is what we had to do. At what point did you realize? Was it just yesterday, or, or in the days prior? Did you sort of reach the realization that you know, uh oh, we we might not have the right guy? It was always a possibility. We knew that two things had to happen for it to be the right guy. We had probable cause to arrest, but we had to be able to put him in Boulder, and we had to be able to say that the DNA in this case was, in fact, John Mark Carr's DNA. So that was always in our mind that this could happen. Did you think early on he was the right guy? Did you think, wow, this is it? You know, I'm going to be real honest with you, <laughs> because on almost a daily basis, Pete and I would look at each other and say, because we were reading these emails each day when they came in, do we think he's the killer? You know, frankly, we started out, it's a long shot. Um, at some point we said, well, you know, 50-50, he could be, he, he might not be. Um, we tested each other on a daily basis. We were always, I think, uh, cautious and skeptical, uh, and yet we always felt that we couldn't ignore it, that we needed to proceed on to the next level. So, you know, we questioned each other daily. Would you do it all again? You know, I, I think that we felt that we, we could not ignore this. We had to follow it. We also had the, an, an issue that we haven't talked about is that there was a real public safety concern here directed at a particular child and a person who was expressing feelings toward that child the same as the feelings he felt toward the dead child. And I have to tell you, that was a huge factor in what how this occurred in this particular so you're case. You're saying you would do it all again the same way? I, I believe we would. No, we would probably try harder not to let the media know. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we would. In the front row? Yes. If that's a public safety issue, then why was Mr. Carr going to be released before Sonoma County was involved in the transaction? Because there was an active investigation in Sonoma County. Why was it that he was just going to be <coughs> set free? if there was a public safety Sonoma issue. Sonoma County was contacted before he was set free. Uh, what I can tell you is that there was a safety plan in place. I cannot discuss it for legal reasons. Uh, do you regard uh, Mr. Carr as totally beyond suspicion now and in the future? I mean, has he been cleared of this? I believe he did not commit this crime. You said about the story coming out of Bangkok. How did the story come out, and what was your plan otherwise? Because there seems to be a contradiction in what your plan was and what <laughs> interrupted it as far as the media was alerted in Bangkok. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, refer to either Pete or Tom who could talk about that. I think it came out while the. My understanding is that, uh, check the dates, but that. Uh, we were having him as an undesirable in Thailand because of the school situation. At some point, uh, we were attempting to get affidavits for searches and other things over there. And I think that the first public acknowledgement, I think there was a cable that went between Justice and the State Department. And I believe, to the best of my knowledge, that's probably 
where the information became became public because it used names. Uh, and I think that that's where it initially came out. And then as soon as that happened, uh, you know, everything broke loose and we weren't able to really follow up and, and do what we were going to do. So there was a State Department leak, you're saying? No, I'm not saying there was a leak. I think there was a cable. And, and from that, that cable, I saw a copy of a cable uh, sometime later. And I don't think anybody leaked it, but I think it just became public. If it had that. not come out of Thailand, then how would you have proceeded? How would you have avoided this all becoming public at this point? Well, we may have been able to get the, the buckle swab over there, and he would have been deported once. Once he was a teacher, he would have been deported in any event. His Could passport he have been taken take to a U.S. embassy or something else other than being brought back to here. Well, you know, I don't know that. I, we were certainly you know. working with the Department of Justice, the Office of International Affairs, and the Legat, Legat and with officials in Thailand, with the U.S. government, and that's not something that was ever suggested to us. I mean. We were relying on people that had a, a great deal of knowledge about foreign extraditions and prosecutions. Christine? I have two questions. Um, the first one being cost. Uh, how much of a cost did your office incur? How much of the taxpayers? I, I haven't added it up, but let me give you a general feeling. Um, we had already committed to hire a part, a full-time contract investigator that was to follow up on the Ramsey case. And we'll, we'll stay with our office and do that uh, based on the 10-year anniversary, which was bringing in a lot of calls. Um, so I don't really count that as part of this investigation because he's going to continue to help us in that role. However, we had uh, travel expenses to Atlanta, uh, probably around, uh, this guess, $800 maybe. Uh, we had travel expense to Thailand of our investigator, which was about $1,500, $200 to rent a room in a very seedy apartment building um, for a month. Um, we had a meal or per diem expenses, I think it was $857. We had the expense of bringing Mr. Carr back. We had to pay for Mr. Carr's ticket and for the investigator's ticket. And those tickets, I believe, were $3,000 each. Those were business class tickets. Um, did I leave anything out? I, you know, there, I may be leaving something out. I think those are the major expenses that we incurred. There are also there were mailing expenses. We had uh, the DNA samples, the surreptitious samples were overnighted to us. We sent a photo over there to follow him. There were phone calls. Um, so, State plane. pardon. State plane. Yeah, the state plane would be a county expense, and um, Joe Pelly, that's out of Joe Pelly's budget. Um, I'm, I think that was around $4,000 that would come out of a uh, county. Are you but we will, no, the exact figures will be available. Are Absolutely. you going to have to go to commissioners for more money on that, or is that in your We budget are hoping or? not to go for a supplemental. We have stayed in contact with the commissioners with proposed budgets of what we might have to incur in relation to this. Um, you know, with regard to the expense, I would like to note to everyone that um, that's always a community concern and it's a legitimate concern. We investigate and prosecute crimes every day that we incur expenses in. It's part of our job. We frequently have to fund travel uh, for witnesses, for investigators. Uh, this is not, as, we frequently incur this much expense with, not frequently, but occasionally, with one expert witness in a jury trial. Um, relatively speaking, it wasn't a huge amount of money. and. We made arrangements with the commissioners to try to take it out of money that had already been allocated to our office for a capital expenditure so we would not cost the taxpayers additional money. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, the Sonoma County authorities uh, issued a statement on August 23rd in which they discussed their involvement with Mr. Carr and they say that they investigated him thoroughly in actually another murder and in some other crimes and they say that they contacted your office and said, hey, this guy is obsessed with the John Bonet Ramsey case. He, at the time, I think even then, he was confessing to it. He was telling this woman, hey, I killed this girl. Here's how I did it. Um, and on the other hand, you folks are saying, we just learned of this guy a few days ago. We just learned his name, and we had to rush out and arrest him before he offended again. 
Can, can you resolve that apparent conflict? Did you know sure. about him five years ago, and did you dismiss him five years ago, or, or, or what Let happened? Let me have an investigator Bennett address that, because he's actually done some research into this okay. issue. The answer to your question is no. We have researched that thoroughly, and we've also solicited the assistance of the Boulder Police Department. The best that we can come up with is information was provided through Sonoma County by a handwritten note and a investigator's report indicating the investigator spoke to someone in Boulder County and he provided a name. The name doesn't match any investigator with Boulder PD, Boulder SO, or our office. Our office didn't receive the information and the Boulder Police Department did not receive the information. What I'm speaking about is we, didn't, we did not receive the uh, name of John Mark Carr. Our databases were checked and rechecked and checked again. We did come up with two individuals with the last name of Carr, K-A-R-R. We did, the DA's office did, and the Boulder Police Department did, and we both came up with the same last names. Neither one were John Carr, and neither were relatives of Mr. Carr. We did not have the information uh, five years ago. The first time we heard of Mr. Carr's name was August the 11th, 2006. So what is, I'm sorry, just one follow-up. What is Sonoma County talking about? Are they, are they, they, you think they tried to communicate with you guys, but, but reached the wrong person, or, I mean, they, they have put out a pretty detailed statement themselves. They have in, information in a report that one of their investigators did, in fact, provide the name of Mr. Carr to someone in Boulder. We've checked that, and we can't find that to be accurate. So we don't know who it was provided to or what agency, but it wasn't the Boulder Police Department or the District Attorney's Office. We're not questioning that they called someone, but the name is totally unfamiliar to us. In the strike, Boucher? Uh, yes, Charlie Brennan, Rocky Mountain News. Uh, Mary, since it became clear this case against Mr. Carr was not going to go forward, have you contacted John Ramsey, and can, can you tell us about any conversation that you have had or might plan to have with him about this? I have not had a personal conversation with Mr. Ramsey. However, I did inform his attorney and close friend. And when did you inform them? On Sunday. Sunday. Has this um, kind of very public misadventure triggered new leads coming in in the last few days or weeks? And, and can you discuss that in any detail? Yes, uh, this has triggered new leads. I'm sorry. Uh, this has triggered new leads. However, they uh, meet the profile of many uh, leads this office re receives either through phone calls or emails where it is an unknown caller providing in information. Uh, typically, it's a name and a name only. There's no location to follow up. Uh, there's not a time frame associated with it. It's just a name of someone that may be responsible. Often the individuals will email us once, twice, 20, 40, 60 times, or they'll call 20 or 30 times during the day or during the evening. It comes to the point where at times we actually need to do research to find out where the unknown caller is calling from to find the number and, and contact them or their local jurisdiction. To, to explain we did receive the information and they need not be uh, tying up the lines because they, they do tie up the telephone lines. So you we regard these new leads as not credible then? We, we do re re review them pretty thoroughly. There's a protocol that we follow where we uh, put like a emphasis on, on them a, uh, and in importance. We keep a database of callers that are new we have a database of callers that are frequent callers as well as uh, letter writers and emailers. When the new information comes up, we ob obviously do a background inquiry onto the name that's provided. But, but typically the information that's provided, uh, it doesn't merit the uh, test of truth. It, 
it's it's of little value. We do give priority from leads that come in through law enforcement across the country and try very hard to follow up on those and get back to those individuals, and that happens fairly regularly. For sure. Melissa Malay with Fox in Denver. Um, what was Mr. Carr's reaction when he was told that you were not going to be pressing charges, the DNA did not match? If he really believes he killed her, was he upset with you for not believing him? You know, we weren't present then. He was with his defense attorneys when he was told. Any word from them on what his reaction was? They Nothing. didn't indicate his reaction, nor would I expect them to. <laughs> Pete, this one's for you. Could you please clarify again that whole extradition, why you guys weren't able to extradite him to California on the misdemeanor charges and then quietly investigate whether he might actually be involved in Ramsey and, you know, and the saliva swab sample from Thailand too, why you weren't able to get that there? Okay. We weren't able to get the saliva sample from Thailand. Uh, Investigator Spray asked a number of times if he would consent to give it. Uh, the direct swab, and he would not consent. On one occasion, uh, I think on a third occasion, the last day, I believe it is, Mark Spray went back in there. They didn't bring their kit with him. It was just expected to be a quick conversation. Uh, he said he would do it at that point. Uh, they didn't have the kit with them, the, the specific uh, Q-tips that they used to do it. Uh, and then again, on the, the plane trip over, I think it was again requested if he would provide it. He again refused or denied that request to do the buckle swab. Uh, the thing about extradition is uh, people don't extradite internationally on misdemeanor warrants where they fail to appear. Uh, and I spoke to uh, uh, the elected district attorney in, in uh, Sonoma County, and he said that they would not have extradited internationally, and he said that that just would not happen. They wouldn't ask, they wouldn't take the cost on just that kind of a case. And I'm not even sure that legally you would be able to do that because you'd have to go through the federal, our federal government who would have to make a specific request to the Thai government. And I'm just not sure that, that anybody would have done that absent the situation that we had here. So I just don't think that was ever possible for Sonoma to do that. You would have had to go through the feds because it was misdemeanor charges? Well, we'd have to go through the feds because we're extraditing from a foreign country. We can't just go into a federal country and operate, even law enforcement. We, when we were operating there, we were operating under specific uh, permission of the Thai government as well as uh, ICE and Homeland Security because you're invading another country's territorial jurisdiction and you need permission to do that. Uh, you know, and, and it's uh, the federal processes that you go through on federal extraditions or mutual legal assistance uh, type of situations are very legalistic and formalistic, and there are rules you have to go through if you don't want to cause an international incident. We were in contact with people at the embassy the entire time, and in fact, the legat there, uh, we worked with her very closely, as well as the uh, uh, Department of Justice person on the ground in Thailand, Chris Sonnerberg, as well as Department of Justice personnel in Washington. Ultimately, you had to get a court order to get the saliva sample even here. Could you have gotten the court order and then gotten the saliva sample over in Thailand, or would that not have worked? Well, that we'd had to go through the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty, uh, which would have required a public affidavit, which would have had to been filed. So, you know, could we have eventually gotten it? Yes. I was wondering how many people do you think you've seriously looked at over the years as potential suspects in the John Bonet Ramsey case, and and how did John Carr's story fit into all this, and did he sort of rank up there as a serious suspect compared to the other ones? Um, I'm guessing between the Boulder Police Department and our office, we've probably looked seriously at 200 people. Seriously. Seriously, at 200 people, um, and done investigation into those 200 people. That's not saying that we've done buckle swaps on all of them. We haven't. There are DNA samples taken on a lot of different suspects. Um, how did, I, I just can't rank them with Mr. Carr. This was so different by the, his being in Thailand and the complications that if he had been here, we probably would have treated him very similarly and you never would have heard about it uh, as the other suspects that we've looked at. Yeah, Tracy Sabo with CNN. A uh, question regarding how many times you actually were able to interview Mr. Carr um, in addition to the alleged confessions he made with the email. Were you able to uncover or investigate any other potential crimes that he may have committed that he potentially could be held for? 
and is he a risk that to society so much that you would consider and is it possible to involuntarily commit him psychiatrically? You know, we can't, um, uh, under HIPAA, we can't talk about any medical issues at all, so we can't talk about mental health issues. Um, we weren't investigating him for other crimes, uh, and I can't tell you that there's evidence of other crimes because we weren't looking for that. Uh, we did have an extremely high level of concern about the attention which was observed by federal agents watching through a window that he was paying to a particular five-year-old girl in the school. And that really was the turning point for everyone, uh, the superintendent of the schools, the Thai government, ICE and Homeland Security, and everyone in our office were not willing to allow anything to happen to that child or any other children in that school. And his, what he was saying has been verified even by the child that it was going on. Now, it is not a crime. Let me emphasize, he did not say he touched an intimate part of this child. It was grooming behavior, and it raised our level of concern to a very, very high level. How this, much this also occurred on the very first day of school. He had mentioned in his emails to Mr. Tracy his desire uh, that he had for a specific young girl who was five years old, along with three other young girls in a class right, right next to his class. And uh, that, that was verified on the very first day of school. And uh, when, when that was brought to all of our uh, attention, like Miss Lacey said, uh, it seemed to be a turning point for not just our office, but for people uh, with ICE that was helping us, people with the Department of Justice, the Bangkok Police, the Royal Thai Police. Uh, there were many, many, many uh, investigators involved in this, and all of them reached the same con conclusion that this this person was proceeding to possibly a event horizon. We were thinking that he may uh, actually act out on what he had been laying the groundwork in his emails. Uh, in all the times been interviewing him, were there, was his story always consistent? There seems to be at least some inconsistency with what he told the Thai authorities regarding penetration, other things, and, and then the story seemed to change. He retracted some of that. That, that was, was totally inaccurate. He didn't tell the Thai authorities that. Uh, that was information that was assumed by someone and was provided, but that is not accurate. So was his story always consistent that... Can we call them? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, it was a follow-up. <laughs> was, was his story always consistent? His story has been consistent. Still is. Can shirt in front row? Um, there was a lot of talk in the emails and in the uh, phone calls about a possible meeting between Mr. Carr and, the, and John Ramsey. Was that ever close to reality, or could it have been? Could it have happened? Could you have scheduled that? Would you have? Um. You know, we talked about so many different scenarios that we might be able to set up. To At one point, we did not know what continent this person was located on. And we were as suspicious that he was up on the hill in Boulder as that he was halfway around the world. Uh, with the Ramsey's consent, we proposed a meeting at the gravesite because he had an obsession with the gravesite of John Benet, hoping that he would not be able to resist the opportunity to meet the Ramses at that particular place. It was at that point that he started stating in his emails, I'm out of the country, I can't return, there's a warrant for my arrest, and I'd love to do that more than anything else in the world, but it's impossible. Um, there were other situations that came up. The uh, Ramses consented to a uh, track of a phone call to the residence where they were staying in Atlanta during Patsy's final days and during her treatment and cooperated in setting that up. And a 13-second or 30-second call was placed to that phone call, but we weren't able to trace it at that time. Uh, and certainly we looked at other situations. Would we talk to the Ramses um, about things. Would you be willing to talk personally to this person? Would you be willing to meet this person somewhere? You know, and I have to state that they were 100 percent cooperative with every request that we made, including a two-day meeting in uh, shortly before Patsy's death.
Back to the first question. Jan Tracy, News 2 again. Um, you said that he was going to be deported be for being an undesirable. Why not have just let him be deported and then get the DNA sample quietly that you needed? Well, we did just let him be deported. He was not arrested in Thailand. He was deported on, he had 24 to 48 hours to leave the country. The arrest did not occur until he was on U.S. soil. And could you have taken the DNA sample then and left him in California waiting? on no. the charges there then? We could have taken the uh, DNA. Let me, uh, I don't want you to be mistaken that they were just deport. The basis of this deportation, this undesirable person, was their knowledge of the emails and our interest in him as a suspect in this case. Would they have been deporting him without that? Probably not. There were other factors involved, the warrant, that was out of California certainly played into it and his activities in the school where he was teaching and his approach to the five-year-old also played into their deporting him but I would have to say that the main issue was the information they were receiving through us the emails they were receiving with regard to the John Benet Ramsey murder. May I ask a follow-up there? Um, was it U.S. Homeland Security that uh, release the information about the arrest prematurely? No, it was not. The U.S. Homeland Security and the ICE agents who were working this case were just, they were 24-7 trailing this guy, assisting us, advising us, doing everything humanly possible to help us bring this person back to this country or to get the swabs that we needed. Um, and I we I do not think they had anything to do with it. We don't know how the information got out, to be real honest. The only, the only thing that I know is that I saw a cable that went from the State, uh, from the Justice Department to the State Department indicating that we were trying to get a, a, federal, a federal warrant. And that was the only information. I think that that would have been picked up by someone. I don't know how it got out. But that was the only, it's only surmise on our part. We don't know who told who or even where it leaked from. Gentlemen in the booth here, second row. Uh, yeah, so Sonoma County misdemeanor charges aside, what should happen to Mr. Carr? Are you concerned that he's going to be out there? That's the always street? been a, a very high concern of ours. And I have to tell you, you know, one of the biggest issues we talked about is are we bringing somebody back to our country that could be a danger? You know, but, you know, we still had to consider that he was a danger to children there. And right, so looking forward now, it. though, now that we've, we've uncovered this rock and we have this character, what do you think as law enforcement officials should happen to him? Well, I think that we cooperate in every way possible with Sonoma to get him convicted, registered, treated, and supervised uh, so that we can assure that somebody's watching to make sure that he's not a community risk. Of course, that's only a misdemeanor, so, uh, you know, on a personal level, are you worried this guy will be out soon enough? Yes, but I also know that at least every parent in this country has seen his picture and knows his name, so you have some ability to protect yourself against him. When we didn't know his location or his name, most children had no ability and the parents had no knowledge of him. We also have the ability for if he tries to work in any school, we can do background checks. His license has been suspended in California and other states have all been notified about that. So they're, you know, they can run background checks on him. I mean, we are concerned. Um, I want to go back to two things. One, the timeline. But, but first, do you think personally that you've served the citizens of Boulder and of Colorado well by calling a news conference, an internationally covered news conference, knowing that about this case, thanking everyone, uh, giving everyone, uh, you know, all the platitudes of what a great job you've done, et cetera, et cetera, when you knew that the only thing you had in this case at that time were his statements. You, you had not connected him to the murder in any way whatsoever, not through DNA, not, not opportunity, not being in Denver, or not being in Boulder, not being in Colorado. The only thing you had was this person saying, I did it. Now, did I, you, did, why sorry, not? you're not finished. Yeah, I just wanted to, do you think you served people well by having this big public news conference and saying, thank you, everybody, you've done a great job, et cetera, et cetera, when this case essentially was nowhere when you brought him to this 
to this city. Well, I have to take a little issue with you, but let me go back and, and uh, describe how this occurred. With regard to the press conference, the press who had learned the day before that an arrest had been made in connection with this case were pounding down our door. Mm -hmm. It was not my wish to go in front of a group of reporters to talk about this case. Prior to that or on that date, I would have avoided it for anything. You all are aware I do not like talking about this case to the media at all. I was told that the press needs to have a face in front of them. They need to be able to see that you're doing your job. You need to tell them what you can, which is not very much. It's an ongoing investigation. So upon the advice of people who are more familiar with the media and their needs, I did that press conference. In thinking about what I can say, it's not very darn much, frankly, uh, because I can't talk about most of the things you want to know about. What I can do is thank people because, frankly, I was totally overwhelmed by the assistance that we received at every level of the government. You do not expect that kind of cooperation from federal, state, and local government, and we got it and nobody complained about it. So it was important for me to thank them because they serve this community. Now you say, you know, what I could say, and what here's where I take issue with you. You say all I did was platitudes and thank yous. Actually, that's not the point of that. The point that I was trying to make, and I think if you read that statement, you'll see it, is back off. Give us a little space. It's early in the investigation, not late in the investigation. We've got a lot of work to do. There are reasons other than that we're convinced beyond a reasonable doubt to arrest a person in a serious case, and those are fear of flight and protection of the community. And I, you know, it was a read between the lines. Please, hear what I'm saying to you. There are good reasons in our mind that we had to do this at this time. And that's what we did do. But th this is not the way we would choose to proceed in this case. And if, if we could have done it differently, we would have done it differently. Uh, uh, just to go back, just uh, as a follow on the timeline, you said that the first time you knew his name was August the 11th. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so you knew John Mark Carr on August the 11th was the person. So you had several days, once you knew his name, to go into his phone records, go into his, to contact his family, to, to, uh, to get his, uh, his database information, his credit cards, et cetera, okay? So in that period of time before he came to Boulder, I'm trying to, just trying to understand here, and just to, just to clarify what was available to you when you had the news conference, what was available to you when he stepped off the plane in Boulder. At that point, when he stepped off the plane in Boulder, I just want to be clear and so that I understand, all you knew was he'd made this confession. Other than that, you had not tied him in any way to this crime. I think the press conference occurred before he stepped off the plane right. in Boulder. Right, but I'm saying at that point you had... So which point are you talking well, about? Well, at the first point, looking, well, let's just talk about when he stepped off the plane in Boulder, okay? Because there's a, there's a, there's a window of opportunity there to do the database work, etc. So the day that he stepped off the plane in Boulder, the only thing you had were, were his statements. Is that correct? We, we had his statements. Correct. We also had the ability to determine a lot of those statements were, in fact, accurate. And as we said before, that's the barometer that we use to determine someone's truthfulness. We did not sit around from the time he was detained and not do background checks. It started immediately and intensely. And, you know, I got to tell you at this point, the, you guys have a lot more resources and databases to check on someone than we do. We have a fairly limited number of people and a limited amount of resources, but, but they were working very hard. TV News. Going back to Los Angeles for a second, L.A. County Jail, once he waived extradition, you had 10 days to go get him. Did you have a legal basis at that point to get his DNA in Los Angeles at the jail? And if so, why did you opt not to do that? We could have done that. Uh, we could have gone and gotten our search warrant here, the basis for it, taken it out to Los Angeles County. And at that point, 
in Los Angeles, gotten a search warrant, uh, and had it executed there by an officer uh, who would go out to the Los Angeles County Jail. And we discussed that. Uh, we also discussed the fact that he had waived extradition. Uh, we wanted him, you know, or he wanted to get out of there pretty quickly, and that we could actually short circuit the process if we just brought him back and got the DNA. You got to remember, one thing I think that's important to point out is that had the DNA in this case determined that he was in fact the killer, uh, we had put together, I think, what would have been an airtight case. We'd have been had uh, confessions in every different form and manner uh, in which to prove that he had done it. We would have had DNA, which would have been taken by uh, Investigator Bennett at the airport, immediately transported or within hours transported to the Denver Police Department lab, it would have been tested by uh, the technician down there, and had that been John Mark Carr's DNA, it would have been a very, very, very strong and powerful case. All the other stuff that, that's happened over the years would have all pretty well fallen by the wayside. We had to be sure that when we brought him back, if it was him, we were going to be able to prove this case. <coughs> Yes, there was a lot of criticism about the champagne and prawns on the plane, and there was some perception that Mark Spray appeared to be getting very close to him physically while in Thailand in terms of rubbing his arm and that kind of thing. Was that by design? Can you explain that method? Um, is there a method of befriending a suspect to get statements? Absolutely. And did we tell, advise Mark to become his next best friend? Absolutely. Um, and Detective Investigator Spray is very good at that. With regard to the prawns and the champagne, I think I need to address that. First of all, our investigator drank orange juice, not champagne. The suspect was not under arrest at the time. We did not have the ability to say, and, and we would if someone was under our custody and arrest, we would not allow them to drink alcohol. But he, it, that was not the situation. It was free. It was, there was not a charge for those items. So we couldn't prevent it. He had a right to have it. it you know, we would have preferred that not, not have been covered by the media, but that's just the way it was. They talked about the fact that they were in business class, and I think we've taken some criticism for that. The arrangements for travel were had to be made through the Thai government travel agency. They needed four seats for the Homeland Security or ICE, two ICE officials, Ann Hurst and Gary Phillips, as well as for Mark and the suspect. Those seats had to be together. Um, there are also security concerns when you're dealing with someone who's suspected of a crime, and that was part of the decision. They actually had to bump people to get those four seats together in that part of the plane, and for security purposes, as that was the best place to have him. They were not outrageously expensive. I can tell you that because when we had to send Mr. Investigator Spray over, we did some investigation into your quick turnaround tickets, and they were a lot more than he paid to come back in business class. Sure. Lee Frank from CBS Radio News again. Mr. McGuire, if I understood you correctly, you said you would have had an airtight case, a strong, powerful case, absent DNA evidence. So is it possible that if you had not had DNA evidence that this man could have been charged and convicted in your mind? Well, I'm not sure that I, I understood. If we'd had DNA evidence. Without DNA evidence. Without DNA evidence. evidence you, based on everything else that you had gathered from him. Based on what we had gathered from him, if we were able to put him in Boulder with rock solid, you know, credit card receipts, uh, somebody who saw him on the hill, uh, would we have had an airtight case at that point? Given the way he described the crime having been committed, it would have been a horse race. Again, you got to look at page 64, but it would have been a very different situation had we been able to put him absolutely right here in Boulder, his confessions, admissions, and description of the crime, but not having DNA. We would have had, it would have been a tribal lawsuit. So the wrong man could have been convicted? There would have been a possibility of the jury coming to a conclusion based upon the circumstantial evidence. It would have made it a very, very difficult case for us to, uh, to prosecute, and whatever the jury decided could have been there. Well, I don't know that we would have filed. I mean, if, would we have filed given that? I think it would have been determinant on how, how strong our circumstantial evidence was. So does this case now hinge on DNA, or where does handwriting analysis fit into that? Handwriting analysis, uh, with all due respect to the handwriting analysts, is a, I would consider more of an art than a science. Uh, especially given the case that we have here, where it was written 
with uh, a felt tip pen. Uh, you don't get the kind of definition that you can with other pens. So uh, that alone is not is not going to be a determining factor. It's a it's a nice piece of evidence if you've got it, but uh, I think there would always be someone who could come in and say, well, you know, on a scale of one to five, this is really only a two and not a four. So this just comes down to DNA at this point, or mainly? Again, if we could put a person who confessed to doing this in the house that night, or as close there to as possible, but their description of how they committed the crime didn't of necessity mean that the DNA found in the underwear was in fact left there as part and parcel of committing the crime, it could possibly be provable. Could you explain that again? <laughs> the way Mr. Carr described the crime... Page 64 of the affidavit. The sal His saliva would be in her blood. That was his description of the crime. So, in fact, there is DNA in her blood, which we can't say absolutely is saliva, but looks like it probably is saliva. And so it would have to be his. Friend Grill? Nancy Greenlees with KUNC. Um, the governor has criticized you, Ms. Lacey, and so has the public defender and others. What are your plans? Well, let me, let me start with the public defender. Have you ever seen a, a case that was dismissed where the public defender hasn't been outraged? Outraged is a pretty typical word. Um, and so I, t I take that as his doing his job, and I don't criticize him for that. With regard to the governor, I think he uh, reacted yesterday. He's a, he's a reasonable man. He reacted yesterday without having the opportunity to read the emails, to listen to the phone calls, to have the affidavit, to go over everything that all of you now have had a chance. And I suspect, based on my knowledge of him, that he will believe differently after he's had a chance to do that. I did uh, contact his office last week and offered to brief him, but I believe he was out of the country, and so that didn't occur. But the offer was made at the time. So there are no plans for your resignation at this point? <laughs> no. I'm sure the governor would love to appoint a successor. You know, I'd, I would like to come back for a minute to the man who called me last night because I expected him to still want me to resign at the end of the phone call. He was very hot, and he was... Uh, you know, tired and feathers pretty strong. Um, but, you know, at the end of the phone call, what he said is, I I've listened to you. You called me. I will go. You've given me the website. I will go back to the website, and I will read the information if I have more questions. I will call you and listen to you. And that's all I ask, is before you become judgmental, try to place yourself back in our spot, Starting in May and coming forward, would you have made decisions differently or would you have found flight and safety of children an important factor, important enough to proceed the way we did? Uh, Pete, um, if you could uh, elaborate or clarify, I just want to make sure that I heard one thing correctly. I believe I heard you say that Carr wanted to get out of Los Angeles pretty quickly and perhaps I misheard. On whose timetable did you get him out of L.A., and was there a consideration given to leaving him there for nine and a half days to buy that extra investigation time before he extradited? We, we thought about leaving him there for a period of time, but he went into court and he'd already waived. I just didn't, you know, when we talked about it, we just didn't think it was fair to, to leave him there when we could bring him back here and, and resolve the case quickly, one way or the other. Christine? Um, was there any thought put again to charging, criminally charging him with false reporting or anything of that nature to kind of set the bar for other folks not to now come forward and make similar type of confessions? Well, false reporting requires that it be done to officials, and his false reporting was done to Professor Tracy. Could you discuss, sorry, Dan Whitcomb from Reuters. Um, could you discuss Mr. Tracy's role in this for just a minute? Uh, reading some of the emails and, and your uh, motion to quash the arrest warrant yesterday, it's clear that Mr. Tracy had a long, years-long relationship with this guy. He, apparently he was working on a book. They were, they were maybe involved together in a book. Um, they were, uh, you, know, it, you know, it seemed like they were getting pretty deep into these conversations. Was, was Mr. Tracy, uh, what, how do you regard his role now? Are you, it, was he a help? Was he a hinder? How comfortable are you with, with uh, the way this all went down? <laughs> Uh, you know, we shared your, your cautiousness with regard to Professor Tracy when he first came in. Um, there was baggage, and we were fully aware of the baggage and, and had some deep concerns about that. And uh, we tested that on many occasions, and we talked about it extensively. However, I can't say anything but 
the highest regard for Professor Tracy, who is a journalist, who could have gone public with this at any time, who was already working on a book or documentaries. And when we asked him to continue to follow this, continue to email this person, and not talk to anyone, he did everything we asked him to do. And there were times when it was very hard on his mental, uh, emotional, and physical health. And he, even though he didn't want to do it, he would continue to do it for us. So I think I um, reflect the appreciation of everyone up here. In The bottom line is he did a great service. But just as one follow-up, he, he has said that he came to you guys and, and was, was saying, hey, look at this guy. Hey, this guy, you know, at the same time that he's maybe working on a book that involves this guy's confession, how hard were you guys pushed by Mr. Tracy to, to go after Carr and... and, and and to what extent was that done uh, all above board? His working on a book with this person evolved as our, partially as our suggestion to him to engage the person uh, because Tracy came in and worked with us and worked with the forensic psychologist on how we might draw this person out so that we could discover the name and the location and we were also pushing to try to place him in Boulder. So much of what Tracy puts in there about the book is a lot of Professor Tracy's information is what we've asked him to do and it's it's obviously not accurate. He frequently would make statements that were not accurate, such as, you know, I'm going to the mountains for a weekend. Basically, what he was saying to us is, I can't deal with this guy anymore. I've got to have some time off. So um, that was part of what was going on. I think that, you know, in, in my dealing with the case, it's not unlike uh, using a confidential informant in any other kind of a situation. What we were able to do through Tom Bennett is be able to monitor the emails on a daily basis. We've got copies of all of them. We were able to monitor the telephone calls. So essentially, uh, Mr. Tracy operated as a confidential informant for our office to try to get information to locate, identify, and uh, you know, rule in or rule out the suspect. And he was very valuable in doing that. You know, we're not unmindful of the fact that Mr. Tracy's been involved in, in this case for a long time but uh, he was very valuable to us, essentially working in an undercover capacity. We're getting pretty close to um, ending right? maybe Sorry. five, six more questions. If there are people who haven't um, asked questions, we'd like to give them the first opportunity. Go ahead. Ms. Lacey, regarding the fact that as of December 25th of this year, it will be 10 years since the death of John Benet Ramsey. And this man is, in your words, not the killer. Can you, in some words, describe perhaps the frustration that you feel and this community feels right now, acknowledging the case, once again, is cold? I don't know if there's one word to describe that, but it's a very high level of frustration. Um, this has been, you know, a disappointment on the part of the entire community and law enforcement and our office on the part of everyone. I don't think there's anyone here who doesn't want to solve this crime with the right person who committed the crime and um, let this community heal from it, let family members heal from it. Uh, we still very much hope that it will be solved at some point and we will continue to actively investigate it and you know I'm out of here in two years and I'm sure my successor will continue as well um, you know unless they really do get me to resign in the meantime <laughs> I'm getting mixed messages on the Ramsey status as far as whether you think they're excluded or not you say no one's excluded yet you treat them more like victims in the public you went to Patsy Ramsey's funeral what is their status you know, I would like to comment on attending the funeral. You, you have to understand that they were cooperating with us uh, very well in those few weeks and helping us in every way they can. You know, when you spend two days with someone who's dying, who's racking a brain that is savaged by cancer uh, and still doing her best to give you names, to help you, to do whatever you ask of her, I felt a, a that personally I needed to go to the funeral and acknowledge that she had done that in her last days. Um, I'm not a personal friend of the Ramseys. I mean, maybe people think that, but that's not true. Uh, we have very little contact. We had limited contact during this investigation. Frankly, if I have something I need from them, I usually go through their attorney, their local attorney, and that person makes that request. They've never said no. Uh, 
you know, that's, it's a separate issue from John Carr, the Ramsey situation. We don't have any umbrella of suspicion. We don't have, you know, two or four or six people who we think might have. Right now, you know, we don't have a suspect that we're looking at as someone who committed this crime. M tomorrow or the next day, could something develop that causes us to believe someone's a suspect? Absolutely. But right now, given the status of the case, we presume the Ramsey's innocent at this point, and we are going forward and investigating it the best we can. I, I don't think that's a mixed message. You, when you say you're giving them the rights of victims, you know, under the Victim Rights Act, they do have those rights, mandatory statutory and constitutional rights. Uh, they, she was, and he is, the parent of the victim of a homicide. And so, as long as they're presumed innocent, we are going to accord them the respect of the parents of a victim. Thank you. What are, can you explain the legalities of surreptitiously swabbing someone? What are his pri rights to privacy versus when you did that and when an, a warrant had been filed? It's really search and seizure law, which is not my forte, so I'm going to turn that over to Bill or to Pete. Well, he wouldn't have an expectation of privacy in things that he had touched on the outside. In this case, uh, the, the swabs taken from his bicycle that he had left outside of his hotel room. So there would be no expectation of privacy there. Uh, the cloth that he was using and drinking cups that he was engaged in and using we would assert that there was no expectation of privacy in those. But if you're going to take a swab and go into a person's mouth, uh, that isn't a violation of his expectation of privacy, would come under Fourth Amendment law by our estimation, and couldn't be done unless we obtained consent or an order by a court. Just a couple more questions. Tom? Uh, Tom, I just want to make sure I'm clear on just one detail. I'm, I, I'm not clear on exactly what point uh, at which you got the uh, buccal swab. Was it on the plane, getting off from the plane, or was it at the jail? It's when the plane landed and stopped at Jefferson County Airport. If you look at the front page of the Rocky Mountain News, he's taking off his gloves. rubber gloves. Would, would, you be, would you know how many false confessions you've had over the years, and how many, or have you had any confessions come in since Carr was arrested? I'm not aware of any that have come in since his arrest. Uh, false confessions over the year, there have been a number. I can't estimate the number. But dozens? Hundreds? I would say dozens. I don't know. That's pretty inaccurate. There have been many. Becker? So back to an earlier question then. Uh, in terms of the surreptitious DNA, when he stepped off the plane either at Los Angeles or here in Colorado, you did have answers from the Denver DNA lab that you could neither include or exclude this gentleman? No. No. Okay. No, no we hadn't. We, I'm sorry. The, the Denver DNA lab says we need the buccal swabs if we're going to make the test. We did not have a warrant to take it when he stepped off the plane in Los Angeles. We hadn't gotten a court warrant. We weren't really sure when he was going to appear until sometime early on that Sunday, I believe. We could have gotten a warrant in Los Angeles had he stayed there, but would have taken a warrant here being taken out to Los Angeles. Instead, we waited. We had our search warrant ready when he landed on the ground in, in uh, Jefferson County Airport. We took it at that point, transported it to the Denver lab, and they turned it around in 36 hours. So it was not processed right. while he was in transit. Right. A couple more questions. Some local reports said there was the possibility of a photograph of a young John Carr with a teddy bear that was much like a teddy bear found in the bedroom of Jean Benet after her murder. Any truth to that or total rumor? You know, my recollection, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that the, the teddy bear angle with the Santa bear, that that actually was answered by the Ramseys in terms of its origin some years ago, and that uh, that had been fully investigated and wasn't related to a suspect in the crime. So any picture like that wouldn't have had significance to us. Um, you said yourself that this was a very extreme, violent crime, a, a bizarre crime um, committed by somebody with a problem. Are, are, you, are you surprised that, I mean, this, that this person hasn't offended again in some way, in, either in this community or elsewhere, that his DNA hasn't come up? Are you, are you sort of baffled by how this person sort of 
came out of nowhere, committed this, this kind of crime, and then vanished into, into thin air like this. Well, absolutely, and that's, you know, part of one factor of what kind of made sense with the fact that Mr. Carr had been overseas and traveling for the past six, five, four, five, six years because, yes, we're very baffled by that. That's not our normal uh, course of how crimes occur, occur with someone who's very violent. They usually are repeat offenders. One final question. Just uh, one last thing. You found out about the DNA on Saturday. Is that right? So why did you wait till Monday? Why wasn't he cut loose right away? I mean, was there a process that you had to go through that, I mean, you knew Saturday this isn't the guy, right? Correct. So, so why wait, uh, you know, 48 hours before all this process? You know, we had uh, made an arrangement. The defense counsel knew that when we would receive the results, we didn't know exactly. They said 24 to 48 hours, so we expected by Sunday night we would have the results. So we had set up an appointment with the defense attorneys to tell them as quickly as possible on Monday. One thing that we needed to do, and, you know, hopefully you have some sympathy with this, is that John Ramsey and the Ramsey family uh, had their hopes very high over this. And this, this was going to be a huge disappointment. In addition, Mike Tracy felt some personal risk to himself, and he'd taken personal risk to himself. And he was having a difficult time dealing with the fact that this might not be the guy after all of the effort he'd put into this and what was going to happen if this guy was cut loose. So our agreement was that we would give them 24 hours, the attorney, to talk to those two individuals and to try to help the family to adjust to it and to try to help Mr. Tracy to deal with it before we talked to the defense attorneys and the defense attorneys were aware of the process. So, so they, they knew that you'd made this agreement, everybody was in, in the loop on this? You know, I don't know if they agreed that we were going to have extra time to talk to John Ramsey and to Michael Tracy, but they knew that we would have the results at the latest by Sunday night. So they knew we already had them when we met on Monday. I don't recall whether or not we talked about the specifics of me talking to the attorney and telling them. I think I did. We also had a meeting scheduled on Monday morning with the Boulder police detectives to for them to fill us in on what what they had found and we wanted to make sure we were fully conversant with it. For instance with records, other records and other things that could have tied in. Thing, right. Interviews they had done for us and and, uh, and investigations they had done into records. So just, just to kind of dot all the I's and cross the T's to make sure that even though the DNA didn't match, you, you didn't have any witnesses that placed him there or anything from there. That's correct. So what hour of what day did you, get you know what, I need to insert something here and I apologize for this. The Boulder Police Department, when we first consulted with them and asked for their help, basically jumped on board enthusiastically. I, well, I don't know how enthusiastic, but energetic. They had put a lot of energy and immediacy into helping us. Never expressed an opinion one way or the other. They just did the work and they did it a uh, hundred percent. And I'm confident that if and when another suspect comes up, they will work very well with us. They did just did an excellent job and we're very appreciative of that. Just to clarify, when you got the DNA back on Saturday sometime and then you notified the Ramseys, Mr. Tracy, <coughs> and then the defense attorney, is that how it happened? Right. We had already set up a meeting at which we told the defense attorneys we would be giving them the results because we would have them by Monday. We still had to have the meeting with the Boulder Police Department to see what other information they had come up with and the results of their interviews of the car family members. So we'd agreed with the defense once we completed those two process, then we would sit down and be very direct and give them what we had, which we did. This is the final question. Yeah, just the, the time of when you got the DNA results back on what day? Saturday. And what time? It was about 10.30. Morning? In the morning. They worked all night. <coughs> we didn't expect them to do that, but they did. Thank you all very much. Thank you.